I'm doing well, thank you. I appreciate you joining me. Hopefully we'll get a few more people, but if not, I will lecture directly to you. So today we are looking at chapter seven, meiosis. I hope you have your notes ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and begin. Okay, this is an image, uh, basically our first, first slide here that shows meiosis. So if you have had a chance to look at mitosis and remember the different steps, you remember interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, I'll pay more attention tomorrow. What we're seeing here is some similar step names, but the format of the chromosomes is very different. Notice here, instead of them all lining up end to end, we got side by side orientation. We got two sets of splits. We're going to go into the differences between mitosis and meiosis. But here's the big picture for all of you. Oriented a little bit better. The big picture is this. Chapter six was uh, mitosis, and that was a cell division process that helps us grow from a zygote, from a fertilized egg, all the way up to who we are and replaces our hair and skin and keeps us updated. Meiosis is all about making babies. So the only cells that are going to result from this process are sperm and egg cells. So this is a very different process that cuts the number of our chromosomes in half. So instead of making a perfect photocopy, we cut the number of chromosomes in half. And that is significant because you need two people to make a baby, right? Both people's genetic information comes together. So you get to donate half, your partner or spouse donates the other half, and uh, now you have a baby. So this is all about making offspring, making babies. All right, let me do a little bit more format stuff here so I can see you and me a little bit better. All right. Meiosis is the basis of sexual reproduction. All right, sexual reproduction depends on what? Meiosis. So cutting the number of chromosomes in half. And then fertilization. So meiosis is making sperm and egg, and then fertilization is joining the sperm and egg together to make a zygote. Now, there's a new term that I'm going to be giving you. It's called homologous chromosomes. So what do homologous chromosomes mean? Well, they are the fact that you have pairs of every chromosomes, and they come from each parent. So for example, you have two full sets of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad, and the, they're numbered. And so a set would be homologous because they're similar, but from different backgrounds. So you have a chromosome number one from your mom and one from your dad. That's that term homologous. Similar, but from different sources is really what homologous means. This statement says different organisms of the same species have the same number and type of chromosomes. So, for example, all humans on this planet, while being different on the outside, have the same number of chromosomes. Now, that is barring something like trisomy 21, which we call Down syndrome. That is a, a, uh, a difference unique to those individuals. But what, what we're saying with this statement is that 99% of all the people, uh, humans on this planet, have the same number and type of chromosome, but the genes that are written there may be slightly different. Okay, so let's talk about somatic cells and karyotypes. Now, a couple of terms here. Somatic, as in the prefix soma, means body. And when we talk about the body, mean the entire body other than sperm and egg. So somatic cells are your body, excluding sperm and egg cells. Karyotype. Karyos means envelope. Now, if you remember, prokaryote and eukaryote before the envelope and with the envelope or true envelope. So the karyos envelope that we're talking about is the nucleus. So if we open up that envelope and take the chromosomes out and spread them out in a picture, that's what's called a karyotype. And that's what you see here in this colorful black image here, that this is chromosome number one, and you have one from your mom and one from your dad. And it could be reversed. It's hard to tell which which parent you got it from, unless you look at the actual genes therein. And you can see they're all paired up here. The only place where they're not paired exactly, potentially, is here at the X and Y, the sex chromosomes. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. Now, in chapter six, we talked about sister chromatids, exact copies. We talked about the centromere where the copies are attached. But what we didn't talk about was homologous chromosomes, since this chromosome is very similar in structure to this one, same size and shape same location of the centromere, is called a homologous pair. So sister chromatids are the same, the exact copies, but then you have these 
pairing up side by side. What is a somatic cell? It's a typical body cell. Any body cell that's not sperm or egg. It has 46 chromosomes in humans, again, barring a genetic abnormality. The karyotype is an orderly arrangement of the chromosomes, usually with the uh, homologous pairs side by side. So you can see some letters. And notice that they are color coded to show you, yes, that these areas are the same because they have the same color, color bands there. Not identical necessarily, but similar enough so that it's very obvious which ones are paired up. Homologous chromosomes are matching pairs of chromosomes, one from each parent. And remember, each of the homologs at one point is going to have a sister attached to it. So what we're going to do, the little preview, is we're going to separate the uh, homologous chromosomes first, and then we'll have an X, and then we'll separate those two, uh, those two uh, sister chromatids in the same way you could se separate a hamburger a double burger into two single hamburgers. All right, so this is a karyotype. Now, one of the things you should know is this is a man's karyotype. Now, how do I know for sure? Well, if you look here, X and Y, the Y, the presence of the Y converts a typical normal human, which is female, into male. So interestingly, males are modified females because in the absence of Y, everybody's female. So the Y has to be there to turn on genes to turn the baby into a boy. Which is what happened with me when I was conceived. All right, here's another karyotype, but a couple of differences here. Similar, but notice these little dashes. These are the centromeres, the places where they're attached to so another way to help ident identify them. Now, if we look down here at the sex chromosomes, we have two Xs that are similar. So this means this is female. So females have two Xs, males have an X and a Y. So humans have 22 pairs of matching chromosomes called autosomes. And if you might say, I thought you said 23. Well, we're going for autosomes, which are the numbered ones. That means non-sex chromosomes, chromosomes that have nothing to do with gender. So those are called autosomes. All the numbered ones are autosomes. And then two different sex chromosomes, X and Y. So in this case, we have two Xs making female, X and Y in the previous making male. Males have the combination XY, females have the combination XX. All right, this is a figure not from your text, but it does show you the life cycle of humans and what happens during meiosis, fertilization, and development. The life cycle of a multicellular organism is the sequence of stages leading from the adults of one generation to the adults of next. Let's go through this figure. We have adults here. Now, what I want you guys to catch is this letter N here. N stands for normal set. Since you got a set from your mom and a set from your dad, every human is 2N, which means you have two full sets of chromosomes, 23 from each, giving you a total of 46. Start with there. Meiosis cuts that number in half. So half of the chromosomes you got from your mom, half the chromosomes you got from your dad, uh, end up in sperm if you're male, egg if you're female. Notice how much larger the egg is. We're going to be talking about that. I prefer um, oocyte or ovum over egg. Egg always makes me think of breakfast. Anyway, so if you notice meiosis, when we started with 46, now we have 23 because we cut the number in half, the total number in half. So the sperm from one person and the egg of another unite. The process is called fertilization. So if I ask, what is the name of the process that joins a sperm and egg together? That's fertilization. What is the name of the cell that's the result? of sperm and egg coming together, that is a zygote. Now, diploid is right back here. That's that 2N thing. Up here, it's haploid. So think of haploid as half, diploid die, two. So one set for haploid, two sets for uh, diploid. The zygote was the name of the cell that we all were on our very first day of life. So after this, after you become a zygote, every cell that becomes you is a result of mitosis and development other than the sperm and egg cells that we produce. Okay, hope that makes sense. Okay, here is another karyotype, in this case, black and white with the light background, again, female with the two Xs. Humans are diploid organisms, meaning that their cells contain two full sets of chromosomes, one from their mothers and one from their father. The gametes are haploid, which is half because you give half and your partner or spouse gives half and then you make a baby with two people 
0.71. All right, uh, what is fertilization? It's the fusion of the haploid sperm and the haploid egg. It creates a diploid zygote or fertilized egg. And there's a picture of the sperm swimming towards the egg, which is surrounded by the zona pellucida, which is a protective coating protecting the egg from damage as it moves through the fallopian tube or oviduct. Okay, I may be asking you to tell me about this figure, so take some pretty good notes here if you can. Remember, rewind this recording, pause, take notes. Please don't try to grab something off the internet because I will know and it will not be worth anything to you. So take notes. Okay, let's go through this a little bit at a time. Step one, we have two single hamburgers or two single chromosomes. These are called a homologous pair. Now, one from one parent, one from the other. To make it less sexist, let's say dad is red and mom is blue, okay? So this is the chromosome that you got from your mom and the chromosome you got from your dad. And there's 23 of these, 23 of this repeating, but it's just showing one pair. Now, in step one, which is called interphase before meiosis. And there's only one interphase. So there's not two interphases, there's just one. Now we go from single burgers to double burgers. There's still only two chromosomes in here, but there's a total of four chromatids because a chromatid is one piece of a chromosome. One half of a du duplicated chromosome is a chromatid. So this is a chromosome made up of one chromatid, this is a chromosome make up, made up of two chromatids. You can have one single burger and you can have one double burger. They're both one hamburger. So this is this red thing is one double chromosome. This is one single chromosome. So try to keep that in mind. This is called a homologous pair, but now they're duplicated. So instead of singles, they're doubles. These are called sister chromatids on both of them. Now, here's the key. In meiosis one, the first set of divisions, the key is the red separate from the blue, but they're still duplicated. So the homologous chromosomes separate. Now, please note, not all of dads go one way and all of moms go the other. That means your parents' mom and your, your mom and your dad chromosomes. It's random. Some of the mom ones go one way and some of the dad ones go that way as well. And then the reverse in the other direction is completely random. So they separate. So we separate the homologous uh, pairs. Now, notice... We have two chromosomes here. Here we each have one. They're still doubles, but there's still one. So the key to meiosis one is the total number of chromosomes are cut in half. We're not worried about chromatids. We're worried about chromosomes at this point. So we had two. Now we have one. This is when the number of go from diploid to haploid. Now in meiosis two, a second set of PMAT, it's very similar to PMAT in mitosis in that we separate these uh, homo, uh, excuse me, sister chromatids. But instead of doing it for 46, we're doing it for 23. And now we have back to still one, but instead of doubles, they're single. So the idea here is that the second round is to separate the sisters. Now, why go through the process of doubling it if you're just going to have it again? Some scientists believe it has to do with the fact that meiosis is just a highly modified version of mitosis, wherein the duplication is still retained, and then another set of divisions is required to get you back to single chromatid chromosomes with half the total as what we started with. Hope this makes sense. Read about it in your text. This image is not there. It's from a previous text. Now, the result is haploid and gametes. Now, you may notice that this N is capital. The previous one was lowercase. Don't worry about whether it's capital lowercase. The N means normal or a full set. Over here, this would be uh, diploid or 2N, because now you have two chromosomes. Here you have one. Remember, the half is not, these are not two chromosomes. This is one double chromosome. All right, hope this makes sense. All right, the process of meiosis. Haploid gametes are produced in diploid organisms. In your notes, put a big giant star here, because that's a review question, so you don't have to ask me. It's right there. Haploid gametes are produced in diploid organisms. That's a true or false statement. And the answer is true because it says it right there, doesn't it? Haploid gametes are produced in diploid organisms. We are diploid. We make haploid gametes so that we can hook up with another person and make a baby. Two consecutive divisions occur, meiosis one and meiosis two, preceded by a single interface. So it goes like this. I'll pay more attention tomorrow pay more attention tomorrow. So that first interphase is the only one for those two sets. 
Crossing over occurs. I'll be talking about what crossing over is. It's a basically an internal mechanism that we have to genetically recombine our chromosomes so that we get more different combinations, meaning that we could never have the same child twice with the same partner, even if we had a thousand babies. And I'll explain how that happens. So here it is crossing over. Now, the way that this works is these chromosomes have the same genes on them for the same traits. So for example, let's talk about the tip right here. This could be the shape of my nose. And the shape of the nose is gonna be the same on both chromosomes, whereas one parent might say slightly rounded nose, and the other would be pointed nose. But because it's going for the shape of the nose, you can exchange those pieces and you still get all of the genes that you need to make the baby. But now instead of all blue or all red, you have mostly blue with some red. And the analogy to this is kind of like taking a uh, ace of diamonds and an ace of spades and cutting a corner off and gluing them together. Well, it's still an ace, but now it's three quarter hearts and one quarter spades. It just makes a slightly different card. And if you played with cards that have been cut up and reconnected that way, there'd be a lot more options for hands that you could play because I don't just have an ace of hearts or an ace of spades. I have an ace of three quarter hearts and one quarter spades, which beats your ace of hearts, whatever. The idea here is you're recombining pieces of DNA so that the outcome is randomly reconnected chromosomes they give a lot more options in the offspring because you don't want the offspring to be identical to each other. Variation, difference is the key. In crossing over, homologous chromosomes exchange a small piece of DNA for the same gene. So they just basically swap tips and that increase variability and survivability of the offspring. This happens during interphase one only. Don't worry so much about when exactly when it happens because it's not on the test and there's a little bit of confusing information in the notes. So. It is in interphase one, but in later they say it happens in prophase, which is not true. But anyway, you guys get the idea. So what is happening? It's genetic recombination. Well, we can do that in the laboratory, but that happens inside our bodies all the time as we make sperm and egg cells. These tips switch, that is genetic recombination, a rearrangement of the genetic code. So on the test, I may ask you, I may put this picture and I say, what is happening here? Well, the answer is crossing over, but also meiosis and genetic recombination. So keep an eye out for multiple correct answers here. So what it's showing you is basically the same process of division that we saw earlier, but beforehand, the tip swap making the chromosome slightly different. Okay, myrosis one, don't worry about these images. They will not be on the test. The main point is separation of homologous chromosomes. It divides the number of chromosomes in half. So that's what I was talking to you guys about. You don't need to worry about these figures will not be in the test, but it does show you all the different stages that happen in meiosis one. Here's meiosis two. The key here is to separate those sisters, those identical copies from each other. So it shows you what is happening here. It's very similar to mitosis, except you're starting with half as many chromosomes as you did in mitosis. Okay, independent assortment. Remember I told you that not all of the mom, your mom's chromosomes go one way and your dad's go the other? Uh, half of moms go one way and half of dads go that same way and vice versa, approximately. Independent assortment means that the chromosomes only line up side by side because they're similar, but there's no labeling of whether it came from your mom or from your dad. It just has to do with the number, the chromosome number. That is, is it one, is it two, is it three, is it four? And the ones that are similar line up next to each other. So in one case, the two blue go to the left and the two red go to the right. In this case, they mix. And this would happen another 23 times, or I guess it'd be 21 times, giving you a total of 23 options for going left or right. Okay, so what it does, it gives lots of options. And this would happen like shuffling cards um, across all of the chromosome pairs, uh, the uh, homologous chromosome pairs. All right, this figure is not gonna be on your test, but it does show, give a graphical representation of the different of the two different processes. So we start with a parent cell for both mitosis and meiosis. Chromosomes duplicate in both situations, but what is gonna to happen to those duplicated chromosomes? Well, we have a duplicated chromosome and it's gonna go prophase. They line in the center. Remember this was metaphase. 
Then you go through anaphase, and now you have two cells that are basically identical to each other and to the original cell. That's mitosis. That was chapter six. Anaphase and telophase, these are the daughter cells of mitosis. But if we go over here to meiosis, it's different. Why? We still get chromosome duplication, but now you get the side-by-side -side orientation that you did not see on my, mitosis. What we're going to be doing is separating these combinations, these tetrads, which tetra means four, so it's four chromatids, but two double chromosomes. I hope you guys can catch that. This is prophase one. This is pairing of homologous chromosomes, the side-by-side -side orientation. And right here is when crossing over. Now, remember, crossing over actually occurs in interphase because the, they're all strung out. Once they become all plumped together, they can't cross over. That's why it's a little bit confusing. Don't worry exactly when crossing over happens. Now we have metaphase one lining up the middle, but instead of all orienting top to bottom, they're still in pairs. The pairs separate. Tetrads align. This is the homologous chromosome pairs. And then you have anaphase and telophase, the same thing, homologous chromosomes separate during anaphase, what I was talking about. So you go from diploid up here to haploid because you separated the chromosomes at the beginning. Notice here we have four non-identical haploid gametes. Up here we have two identical cells that are identical to the parent cell. Here we have half as many as what we started with. And they're all very different from each other. This is a big difference between mitosis and meiosis. All right. So now looking at that figure, let's do the notes on it. Mitosis. A diploid parent cell results in two identical diploid daughter cells. Use this slide for your review questions. There's only one round of I'll pay more attention tomorrow, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. There's no alignment of homologous chromosomes in mitosis because we're not going to be separating them. It results in all body cells except sex cells. So everything that you would call your body is made by mitosis. In meiosis, a same diploid parent cell, now instead of making two identical diploid cells, makes four non-identical gametes. Now, in females, there's actually no separation of the cell, and it all just becomes one big egg. So the the chromosomes get separated and then are destroyed, but the cell itself never actually divides. That's a little bit of a difference. There's two rounds of division, but with one interphase at the beginning. There is alignment and separation of homologous chromosomes. Maybe that was that side-by-side -side separation. And it results in gametes only, no body cells. So very different. This is what I'm going to ask you to be able to do on the test for this chapter. Uh, why can't I maximize this? Uh, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Okay, uh, so I'm guessing you guys can't see that anymore, but you can see me, correct? Is that right? You guys, yeah, I, I guess you can't see it because it is, uh, I shut it. Um, do you have any questions about what we covered today or anything that's happening this week? Okay. Junis, do you have any questions uh, about what we covered today or what's happening this week? Okay. Um, well, I do want to say thank you both for coming. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your week and you have a good upcoming weekend. I hope to see you in lab on Monday. Have a great week, guys, and uh, thanks for again for coming, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.